Have you ever been alone? I mean, truly alone. Total isolation. No one to talk to, no one to help you. Not a soul in sight for hundreds of miles. Understandably, we tend to avoid this sort of isolation. Instead, we seek comfort, company, familiarity. But should we? Sure, those things represent safety, but they can also be a fishbowl, a prison of our own making in which we endlessly circle, cut off from all the joyously varied color and culture and even chaos beyond. Even the most pleasant of experiences can become a fishbowl. Because many of those things that we seek for protection, for stability, can also stifle us. And in a somnolent world of, of comfort and ease, we can grow incurious, inflexible, and worst of all, indifferent. I grew up in a small village in the southwest of England. It was a bucolic hideaway with a couple hundred friendly folks living in pretty houses, some of which were hundreds of years old. The village was strung along a gently snaking valley of green hills and picturesque hills, roamed by uh, <laughs> green fields and picturesque hills, roamed by livestock. And it was in many ways the rural British idyll so lovingly depicted by centuries of poems, paintings, and novels, William Wordsworth, John Constable, Thomas Hardy. But I always knew there had to be more out there, a world beyond my own backyard that I longed to see. And so in my early 20s, I finally summoned the courage to set out and explore it. This was my life's first true leap of faith. I set myself the challenge to cycle to the furthest away point in each of Europe, Asia, and Africa. I chose a bicycle simply because it was affordable. I already had a basic bike, nothing flash, that I bought secondhand on eBay several years earlier, $100. For more than four years, I doggedly pedaled tens of thousands of miles across continents, cycling twice the distance of the Earth's circumference. I traversed deserts, mountains, jungles. I experienced searing heat, probing cold, and, at times, crippling loneliness, all in my quest for discovery. But mostly, I enjoyed myself, even if a lot of it was what I would call type two fun. For the uninitiated, type two fun is something that's actually not fun at the time but later blossoms into enjoyment with the soothing balm of hindsight. <laughs> with every new challenge confronted and overcome, I grew more capable, more confident. The journey changed me forever. It left me with a wealth of new friends, memories, and learnings that totally changed my perspective on life. Like an elastic band stretched to its limit, I could never truly resume my former shape. I would never return to my fishbowl. For well over a decade, I continued to undertake challenging journeys to remote places. I reveled in the human interactions these expeditions enabled, seeking advice about wolves from a lonely Tibetan shepherd, roasting sweet potatoes over a fire with warring mountain tribesmen in Papua New Guinea, or navigating whitewater rapids in a dugout canoe with the help of Congolese fishermen. I also relished the challenge, both physical and mental, that reaching these hard-to-access places entailed. The journeys often involved long periods of isolation, and I did often struggle with loneliness. But over the years, I slowly started to appreciate those solitary bouts. The poet, May Sarton, once said, loneliness is the poverty of self, solitude is the richness of self. Gradually, I learned to appreciate solitude. And so last year, I embarked on my most daunting expedition yet, a 600-mile hike along the frozen surface of a river in far northeast Siberia. This two-month trek across the world's coldest inhabited region would take me through several small indigenous villages where many residents still survive by traditional means of ice fishing, fur trapping, and reindeer herding. In the villages, I would gain insight into local people's lives, and between them, I would pit myself against the brutal Arctic winter conditions, camping in temperatures down to minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I loaded all the necessary equipment into a sled, including flares to deter wayward wolves or curious bears, 
and flew into the regional capital, Yakutsk, way up in the permafrost zone. But as I set about gathering food supplies for the journey ahead, Vladimir Putin had other ideas. Three days after I arrived, and exactly one year ago today, Putin launched his brutal, illegal, and wholly unjustifiable invasion of Ukraine. Vast columns of tanks and Russian soldiers surged across the border, and the world awoke, stunned and horrified, to a new age. Meanwhile, in Russia, the Kremlin-controlled media ceaselessly spewed Putin's propaganda lies about neo-Nazism at the heart of Ukrainian government and a supposed genocide against Russian-speaking peoples in the Donbass. An information war was underway, with a total duality of perspective between East and West. I had a decision to make. Should I play it safe and go home while flights still flew? Or should I seize this opportunity that had fallen into my lap to probe the opinions of ordinary people in this far-flung corner of a country newly at war? Well, as you've probably guessed, curiosity got the better of me, and I stayed. I took a short flight over the Verkhoyansk Mountains to the remote Arctic settlement of Batagai, one of many grim northern towns that spiraled into poverty, violence, and alcoholism after the Soviet Union collapsed. I pulled my heavily laden sled out of town, away from its unsmiling citizens, away from the ceaseless news of war and destruction, and into the uncomplicated embrace of the wilderness. I followed a Zimnik, a seasonal ice road cleared on the surface of the Yana River so that truckloads of coal could be shuttled down from a port on the faraway coast. As I plodded steadily north, my world contracted and I focused on survival. It was cold. Waking up in my tent each morning was a daily exercise in stoicism. Clumsily fumbling through multiple pairs of gloves and with fast numbing fingers, I would hurriedly melt snow to prepare a simple breakfast of coffee and porridge that had to be bolted with undignified haste before it grew cold. Leaving my sleeping bag, it was a race to get everything packed up and start moving before I lost all sensation in my hands and feet. Then I would walk all day, pausing only for a 10-minute lunch of frozen cheese and a local salami I later learned was horse meat. When the sun dipped, it would be a rush to re-pitch my tent and finally retreat to the refuge of my sleeping bag. I went days on end without feeling my toes. And honestly, I loved it. Type 2 fun at its very finest. Roughly once a week, I reached a village. Saka people welcomed me in, showed me around, and told me about their lives. The Saka are a horse-breeding Turkic people who were pushed north centuries ago by the Mongol expansion. In the first village, I was used as a doll for an afternoon by a few elder Saka ladies who delightedly dressed me up in their various local traditional costumes. They seldom spoke of the war. More pressing among their concerns were the summer wildfires that ravaged the region more ferociously with every passing year. Indeed, I'd walked fast past vast tracts of burned-out forest, blackened charcoal trees tilted and toppled forlornly against one another, starkly silhouetted against the virgin snow. With little access to the internet or independent media, the people I met had a tightly controlled supply of information. These were the Russians most prone to propaganda, and most people I met did profess their support for Putin and his war. Although I did meet free thinkers among them, people who nervously confided their regret and even their disgust at what was happening in Ukraine, yet I never heard a single person speak out in front of anyone else for fear of being reported to the authorities. That old Soviet-era sense of suspicion, paranoia, and distrust had flooded back into society so quickly. After a month of steady progress, I emerged from the forest onto the tundra, a blank, otherworldly land that few people call home. And at night, when the northern lights danced and folded across the night sky, I would gape spellbound for a few precious minutes before once again retreating to my tent. I had entered now the realm of the Evenki people, hardy reindeer herders who have lived in an affectionate symbiosis with their animals for centuries on end. Yet even at this remotest reach of the Eurasian landmass, 
the modern world encroaches and life is changing. Increasingly, young Evenki people are moving south in search of education, employment, running water, indoor toilets. An ancient way of life is slowly disappearing. But try using an outhouse at minus 60 degrees before you pass judgment. At the coast, I turned west and walked two weeks on the frozen Arctic Ocean to the port town of Tixi, my finishing line. 600 slow miles had passed beneath my boots, and I thought I was nearly home. But on arrival, I was arrested. The outcome, naturally, was a foregone conclusion. Guilty. They flew me back to Yakutsk and locked me up to await deportation at some indeterminate point in the future. I was confined to a cell around the clock and watched by cameras in the ceiling. Small, bland meals were handed through a hatch in the cell door. I shared with two men, both prone to bouts of angry shouting and smoking tea bags once their supply of cigarettes ran out. Two months of treasured, voluntary solitude in the wilderness had morphed into the unexpected agony of enforced isolation. Every passing day was an eternity of uncertainty. And the worst part was, with no release date given, I was counting the days up rather than counting the days down. One day, two days, three days. It had been hard to get out of my tent on the cold mornings, but now it was literally impossible to get out of my cell. I had never known such utter helplessness, such a total lack of agency. I fought off boredom as best I could with exercises, a Rubik's Cube, and a small handful of books. But none of these could fully distract from the fear and despair that ebbed and flowed hourly through my consciousness. Sudden waves of panic as I wondered, will I ever get out of here? One day, I was led out of my cell and thrust before a video camera. The same questions the judge posed in court were now thrown at me by a journalist. I wondered, was the court of public opinion now being prepared for my retrial on more serious charges? There was vague talk about a 15-year sentence. I'd be 50 years old by the end of that. I managed to fashion a passable set of dice out of bread and toothpaste. Although, unfortunately, playing dice by yourself isn't exactly the most fulfilling of pastimes. On the one hand, you always win. On the other hand, you're always a loser. <laughs> to combat the frustration, the fear, and, yes, the loneliness, I tried to draw on my years of pushing and challenging myself. But the wisdom I had accrued during extended periods of isolation in the world's wilder places were only so much use in this strange new situation where choice had been removed from the equation. And so time dragged on in this tortuous new fishbowl. One week, two weeks, three weeks. After a month, miraculously, they deported me one day. I was flown to Moscow in handcuffs and under guard, escorted through the airport by a SWAT team, and finally placed on a flight out of Russia. I didn't allow myself to believe it was all over until the plane actually took off, at which point I wept uncontrollably. Freedom at last. Airline food has honestly never tasted so good. <laughs> and now, looking back at my time in Siberia, two things particularly stand out. Firstly, most of the ordinary people I met were, in some sense, as much hostages of the Russian state as I had been. They have no choice but to be there, no access to honest information, and no chance to speak out safely should they see the regime for what it is. Russia is their fishbowl, and I continue to consider this war as Putin's, not theirs. And secondly, I have a new perspective on isolation on solitude. I did indeed struggle with loneliness in that prison cell. Enforced isolation cuts deeper, and applying the wise words of May Sarton is that much harder when you haven't opted to be alone. But I have no doubt that I would have struggled that much more without my previous experiences. Through stress testing, we grow stronger, thicker skinned, and better able to clear the hurdles that life throws in our path. And so I urge you all, do difficult things now and then, and do them alone sometimes, even if, or perhaps especially if they're type two fun. 
Because choosing to overcome self-imposed problems is definitely the best preparation for the challenges we don't choose but are forced to face. Thank you.